This podcast is for informational purposes only and is not provided as financial, legal, or any other advice. The information is not investment advice or an offer to buy or sell any securities or make any investment. The views expressed by guest speakers are their own and any reference to third-party products, services, or information does not constitute an endorsement thereof by SNN or its affiliates. SNN expressly disclaims all liability for any individual's use of the information presented in this podcast. We are including McCoy Global's forward-looking statements that are available on McCoy's investor relations website at McCoyGlobal.com. My guest on the show today is Jim Rakovich. He is the president and CEO of McCoy Global. It's a publicly traded company. The symbol is MCB on the TSX. McCoy Global Inc. is a product and service provider for the international oil and gas sector with new digital technology solutions. McCoy's series of smart products seeks to increase efficiency, well-bore integrity, and safety by eliminating human error and guaranteeing consistency and repeatability of casing running operations worldwide, according to the company's website. I originally heard McCoy Global's presentation at the Small Cap Discoveries event back in October 2023, and they will also be presenting at our upcoming investor conference, the Planet Microcap Showcase Vegas 2024, happening April 30 through May 2nd. Despite operating in a cyclical industry, the company has been around for 100 years and has a global footprint with operations on every continent. I invited on Jim to better understand the following. How McCoy Global has evolved and provided a product and services suite for the current oil and gas environment, competitive landscape and customer base, their digital technology solutions, and Jim's three to five year vision for the company. With that, please enjoy my conversation with Jim Reykjavich, president and CEO of McCoy Global. Jim, thank you for joining me today. How are you doing? Great. I'm doing well. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Absolutely. It's great to have you on here. So just for quick background, everyone listening in, you know, we are, uh, McCoy is going to actually be presenting at our upcoming conference in Vegas, uh, Planet Microcap Showcase Vegas 2024, April 30 through May 2nd, 2024. Go to, if you want to, you know, see him in person, meet, whatever, go to planetmicrocapshowcase.com. And you're actually, if you're listening to this, you might've saw, we did a short form interview uh, that we put out a little bit earlier than this one. So, you know, now is our opportunity to, you know, I was holding back. You know, I, I had a lot more questions, but, you know, now's our opportunity to, to dig a little deeper into the story. So with that, you know, my first question I ask everybody on here, Jim, is what would you say is that one line that best describes McCoy Global? We're a, uh, uh, we are a provider of uh, solutions for our customers with technologies in the oil and gas industry. Very good. All right. So we're going to, good, you, the, nice, nice little umbrella. There's a lot we can get into from there. So, you know. I, I jo- it's funny. I joked on the uh, on the short form, you know, about your history. You know, it's a hundred year history here. So now you now's your chance. If you want to get into it a little bit more, you can. So you know, let's take a look back at that history. When was the company founded, and what was the original thesis for its founding, and how has it evolved to where you're at today? Well, the company was founded in uh, 1914 in Edmonton, Alberta, and uh, by uh, Henry McCoy, and he started out as a blacksmith shop. So I guess to some extent. He's been manufacturing or putting things together uh, right from the beginning. And uh, uh, they continuously grew uh, as uh, as industry grew uh, and uh, got into uh, spring manufacturing when uh, when vehicles and uh, automobiles started to become and trucks became an important thing. Uh, so they started manufacturing uh, steel springs and in Edmonton, and then they they started uh, doing repairs to suspensions on vehicles. Then they started producing trailers like manufacturing, and Alberta being an oil and gas uh, really foundational industry in our province, and uh, so a lot of what they were doing were, was related to oil and gas, all of the any kind of products or services they were providing. And as the company grew, uh, second generation took over, and then eventually the third generation of McCoys uh, took over, and uh, which is actually pretty impressive, considering not a lot of family businesses get to the third generation successfully. Uh, so fast forward, uh, the company was sold to a private equity group in 1995. Uh, they took it public in 1996, and shortly after that, um, I got uh, uh, brought into the organization uh, because of my operational background. They had one of the business units that needed some help. 
and uh, basically go in and uh, do a tur turnaround on the business. And so I, I did. And uh, as the, uh, the company at that time still was a bit of a conglomerate of other uh, technologies they produced, like uh, oil field trailers and uh, things like that. Uh, and then in 2002, I, uh, at, at that time, I was the chief operating. I had elevated over that period of time to chief operating officer. And then I uh, got asked if I would take the role of a chief executive officer. So I did. And uh, that was in the fall of 2002. And from there, we started really focusing the, the, the business on the technologies and the, the customer and the uh, area that is our 100% focus today, which is uh, tubular makeup. Uh, so our customers are in the business of running casing and wells, land and offshore all over the world. And our, our objective in life is to make their job easy, safe, and efficient, and environmentally friendly, to provide better wellbore integrity. Every well that's drilled around the world for any hydrocarbon, whether it's uh, gas, oil, uh, or any other uh, hydrocarbon, uh, and whether it's even geothermal, uh, in those uh, cases, uh, they run casing in, in wells, and it's steel pipes screwed together. It sounds easy, but it's complicated, um, especially when you get into West Texas, where it's uh, long laterals and uh, premium connections and uh, a lot of uh, a lot of difficult situations. So our our job is to make it easy for them. So, Jim, my next question for you has to do with the just taking a look at the competitive landscape, because I also think that best illustrates all the products and services that McCoy Global does currently. And, you know, there's actually a great slide on the company's website, it's slide seven on your investor presentation, the broadest product and service offers offering in the industry where you have the company does hydraulic power tongs, CRT, data acquisition, handing equipment, and you have a footprint in East, in the Eastern hemisphere. And you'll see that, you know, McCoy does all those things and the, you know, your other competitors, which was nice. You didn't, you didn't name them. That was a nice touch. Um, you know, and they only do maybe one or two of those things. So kind of a two part question. One, you know, how does your product set and services unique and different compared to your peers out there? And why did the company decide to focus on delivering all these different aspects uh, instead of just focusing on one or two? Well, I'll, I'll say that uh, in some of the legacy equipment, uh, in the first column hydraulic power tongs, for example, uh, how does that compare? Uh, we have some very good compa uh, competitors, particularly in North America. That's a legacy product that's been around for decades. When you have a technology or a product that's been in the market for a long, long, long time, uh, the, everybody kind of uh, does the main players in, the, in, in those products typically do quite well. So uh, I would say the differentiator with us with the old technology is there's not a lot of differentiation other than we have a large installed base, which is I'll talk about is really important uh, in particularly in the Eastern hemisphere in the Middle East. Uh, and that's been, that's been developed over the last 20 years. Uh, but when it comes to the other individual technologies, we do have a lot of different functions and features on our technologies that are different. The handling tool side, the FMS, it's so unique. There's, there's, there's flush mount spiders is the, the term FMS, uh, but ours is unique and we've got some uh, uh, technology designed into that tool that nobody else has that adds a tremendous amount of value to the customer. On the fact that we have a physical presence in the Middle East is really a critical uh, differentiator as well. Uh, customers in that region uh, the fact that we support them regionally, we, ha we have 16 people based out of that facility in Dubai now. And we look after all of the Middle East, North Africa countries. We look after Southeast Asia from there. It's really quick. We, we have spare parts. We provide technical support and uh, technical sales right out of, right out of our, our, our group there. And so all of those combined, if you ask, you know, why did we decide to do it is because we can, we always felt we could best service our customers by being really a one-stop shop and say, look, if you, it doesn't matter which of these technologies you need and, and ours work well together. So, you know, why would you shop anywhere else? Very good. 
All right. So, you know, another question I have has to do with the addressable market, right? Because, you know, you look, you, you know, you just, you take one look at the, the presentation, like, okay, they're global operation, right? They have headquarters in all the main oil and gas hubs around the world. You know, the company, you know, you're cash flow, you're generating cash, you're profitable. You know, the company's done what in, in 2022 is about what, 62, 63 million. You know, you're, You've already, I think, uh, at around around fifty, I think, for just up until you know, as 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 uh, I think up until Q three, yeah, yeah, something like that. So you know, tell me about scalability, addressable market. You know, tell us how this this you know, there's this is uh, inning two versus inning seven. Well, uh, the reason is because of technology. Um, there's no question about that. Uh, the addressable market. Uh, for us, what we uh, the technologies we've been developing and where we're headed and why you know where the growth opportunity is is dealing with uh, the biggest headache our customers have had for a period of time, which is labor. Labor costs are 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 half or more of the cost of running casing, and labor is harder to find. Uh, experience has retired or left the industry uh, since COVID. It's getting harder to get people to 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 leave and go work in um, Odessa, Texas and for two weeks and then back home for a week and uh, 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 and then finding them uh, and then cyclicality in the industry, the younger generation, they don't really find that, that kind of, those kind of roles attractive. So it's been very difficult. So we consistently heard from our customers, recruiting, training and retaining people and the cost has been a real issue. So what we've done is put together a technology package that when all these technologies are put together into an integrated package, which we're working on field trialing this year, um, that will reduce that, that headcount and cost and reliability on experience tremendously. And that's going to add a, a lot of value to, and, uh, to our customers. For sure. I mean, uh, you know, from what you can tell us, can you get into that a little bit more about, you know, how all those technologies are kind of siloed right now and why tell us more about the solution that you're putting together? Sure. From we, what you can, of course, I, you know, I don't, you know. you know, we, we, we started this journey six years ago to say, look, this is the problem. Let's, let's solve it. You know, we, you know, uh, I always like to say that, you know, in this part of this industry, uh, when it comes to automation and using digital technologies and sensors and that kind of thing, we're going to boldly go where most industries have gone before and uh, change the way things have been done for decades. And uh, the technology is there. You just need somebody who really understands the application and how things really work in the field. And uh, the fact that we have so much experience on the individual technologies uh, we are able to make them smart because we have uh, we've during this journey we did a couple of key acquisitions, uh, one of them on a specific tool that was required the casing running tool, and then we did an acquisition in Cedar Park, Texas, which is the suburb of Austin, and their expertise was something we needed as a core competency, which is collecting data in harsh environments, and so we have the. Uh, the, the, the electrical, the sensors, the data acquisition expertise, we have the mechanical expertise, and we have the application. So we, as we've been developing each product uh, that's going to be part of this integrated package, what we're excited about is individually they've been commercialized, they've been commercialized on their own. And now that we're bringing them together, you know, it's, that's going to create our integrated package. So we're already getting, we're already getting, customers understanding the value of individual technologies and the, but the real win to get back to your 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 at your absolute question is you know what inning are we in when it comes to the fully integrated automating this this process um, where we are in the second inning and uh, so the next inning is 2024 is getting the field trials completed, getting getting the integrated package proven that it works really well and you can run casing uh, more efficiently, safer, uh, improve well-bore integrity, remove the requirement for experience, and most importantly, remove at least half of the people required to do the job and, um, and uh, have uh, that uh, be the, uh, be the real... Um, 
be the real technologies that solve the problem. Absolutely. You know, I'm sorry I used a baseball reference. You're in Edmonton. I should use the hockey reference. I don't know. It's like the first five minutes of period one. I don't know. You know, yeah, next well, well, we're halfway through day. the first period. <laughs> there you go. We're, we got past the warm up. <laughs> yeah, there you go. You know, again, you know, not, I, you know, it's post Zamboni. Hey, know. I still play. So, yeah. oh, that's really cool. Um, I'm in LA. I'm sorry. We did this. I mean, I'm sure there's hockey teams, you know, but there is. But, uh, so my next question then for you, you know, has to do with the cyclicality of the, the business and oil and gas. I mean, you know, it may seem like ancient times at this point, but we did just come out of a pandemic, you know, during that time there was, you know, uh, not so much travel, not so much use, you know, the wells more or less stopped, less construction. Now, obviously, you know, things really ramped back up and went kind of gangbusters a little bit. You know, it's, it's funny. I'm actually going to be. I, 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 we I try and cover as much as I can on the space because it just there always seems to be new news and new highlights and whatnot. So, how does the company, you know, keep up with the changing of the tides of this industry and manage some of those changing of the tides as as things can change uh, on a dime? Well, first, when it comes to the pandemic, I think that you know you got to consider that a bit of you know a real black swan event. Um, there was a lot of industries got whacked by that. Um, but uh, to your point about our industry having cyclicality, there's no question about it. You know, the price of a barrel of oil has changed and gets cyclical. If you, I think a better comparison is from 2015 to 2019. Uh, that that was a, a down cycle. So what did what did McCoy, what is you know what did McCoy do? We understand the cycles pretty good, and our objective is always to be. Uh, adjusted a bit of positive through all of the cycles. And we actually took advantage of, we went into that downturn with a very strong balance sheet. And uh, sometimes you have to look at that as opportunity. And the opportunity was we were able to complete those two really critical, strategically important acquisitions, not when they were priced high at the top of the cycle, but we bought those, uh, an example is the uh, the business we bought in Cedar Park, Texas, the, the uh, data acquisition company. We bought that company for just over six million U.S. at that time in 2019, and then last December December of 2022, we did a sale and a lease back on. It included the land and buildings. We did a sale and a lease back on the land, just the land and buildings for six and a half million. So it paid for the acquis it paid for the acquisition, and uh, we got all of the business for nothing essentially. Anyway, but we also used that time to to focus and work on the technologies. And the other thing that's I think is really important to understand is when you look at our financials and you look at the breakdown of uh, where we get our revenue, we have a large aftermarket um, uh, segment. So. When I describe we have a large installed base of legacy equipment and new equipment in the Middle East and all over the world, uh, we every quarter you look at our revenue, you're going to see for you gonna you got to know that forty percent of that revenue is aftermarket replacement parts and consumables. That is a pretty steady business, and even in the downturn, the nice thing about McCoy is we still have a good income stream because people actually repair more than buy new equipment at that time. Very interesting. Yeah, no, I mean, it's kind of, it's McCoy, you're, it's a very fascinating place where the company is right now. Cause it's very rare, especially in these are, well, maybe not so much, but I mean, in micro cap circles where you see a company that's doing, you know, trailing 12 months, you know, 60, 70 million profitable cash flow positive. And I mean, you know, you're probably Right now, we're recording this on January 23rd, 2024. Stocks at, you know, what, 50-ish million market cap. You know, I, what what are we missing? What 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 am I missing here? I'm not, well, listen, I'm I, not saying that it's a, you know, no buy ratings, anything like that. I'm not a shareholder, but I feel like I'm missing something. You are. And what you're, and I think what the market's missing is they're, they're putting no value on where we're headed and how close we are to that over the next couple of years uh, with our, with our, with what our real technology package is going to be. And we've already got traction on individual uh, technologies that we've developed in the last couple of years. And um, the market's rewarding us for stuff we're doing anyway. 
are, you know, we're making, you know, we're, we have a really good business that does very nice EBITDA margins and generates really good cash. Uh, and, um, but the markets, I guess what you're missing is the markets not giving any value to uh, what's coming. Interesting. I mean, why, why is that? Are they, is it, is, you know, cause actually one of the questions I usually ask on here is, you know, uh, what, you know, even after hearing the story, you know, taking a look yeah. at financials, going through the deck, you know, meeting you, you know, it, sometimes, you know, investors might still be like, you know, what am I most, what am I missing? Or what are they still confused about? Maybe some of their frequently asked questions. So, I mean, maybe, maybe we can answer some of that here. Cause it seems like that this is really it, right. It's like, okay, it looks like business is solid. You know, they have, you know, they have their, their, their headquarters generating cash, all that kind of stuff. But it's, it's this one piece that's missing that. So, um, but, but maybe you can answer some of those frequently asked questions then. Well, I, I think part of the, part of the answer is, you know, we're, what we're doing today, I think with uh, planet microcap and the fact that we're going to attend Vegas, you know, Alex uh, Riskoff on our board, he's a, uh, he's the chair of, uh, our strategy and capital allocation committee. He's uh, he's worked with us uh, to get more of the story out uh, into the market. So I, I and I I think that's that's helped. Particularly if you look at our stock performance over the last year, it's it's done quite well, uh, very well actually. I think we're one of the best or one of the top energy services performing stocks in 2023 on the Toronto Stock Exchange, but. Uh, you know, one of the things that, again, is I, I think getting the word out there, getting uh, micro cap investors to hear about this. Story. First, you got to hear about it and then you got to, um, you know, get to learn about it a little more. And hopefully we're doing some of that today. Absolutely. All right. So here's another question that, you know, I'm not I'm not here to paint the, you know, just the flowery picture here. You know, I, no. with every potential investment comes risk, um, potential downside, all that stuff. So, you know, in your opinion, what what would you say are some of the company's downside risks aside from execution? Right. Like, let's let's obviously let's put that out the door. Like if the company sure. doesn't execute on, you know, the new technological package that you're looking to put together for ONG services, obviously like that. That would not be great. But aside from that and Black Swan, you know, pandemic uh, events, you know, what would you say are some of the company's downside risks? Well, I I think it's just uh, what we talked about earlier. When it comes to risk, what does Jim worry about? You know, I just worry about, um, you know, if, uh, if, a, if, if economies do not respond, consumption of, uh, you know, we rely on uh, consumption of uh, hydrocarbons. And, um, uh, you know, our, our view is that over the next 10, 20 years, this, the demand, if you see the demand uh, that it, it's over 100 million barrels a day today and continues to grow, actually. So uh, we think we're in a great spot uh, uh, that wise, but things happen and price of oil can go down to $40 or $30 a barrel. And then activity slows down, and that those are the things that impact us directly. But when it comes to execute, you're right. Uh, execution, you know, we put that aside. It's really the uh, uh, the you know the market drivers that that really would pose pose a risk. Very good. And and how does the company plan to continue to maintain you know profitable enterprise while also keeping in mind some of your growth trajectory that you're looking to achieve? Well, the good news is, is that over the, to put it in perspective, we, we've invested over $20 million US in our technology roadmap since 2018 uh, to develop all this stuff. So the best way to think about it is the bulk of the CapEx is spent, the vast majority of it. Where we're at in that journey to, uh, uh, to commercialize our integrated package uh, that money's the, the vast majority of that, then that includes those two acquisitions. The majority of that money's been spent and, and look at our financial performance during that period of time. It's all positive. Even through COVID, we were even a positive. Uh, so um, I would say that, um, you know, the, uh, the ability for us to continue down that path is, is excellent because our requirement, our OPEX is very low and, um, uh, so we, uh, uh, you know, we, 
we have an ability to manage our cash very well without uh, being stuck with high capex in, in, in either product development or in uh, production. Absolutely. And just, you know, so that, you know, I'm sure people might be looking at the company while we're talking here and, uh, you know, the company also throws off a dividend as well. You know, yeah. so you want to talk about that a little bit? I mean, that's yeah. the, 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 it's part of our capital, you know, I guess, you know, some, you know, often from investors or potential investors say, well, how do you allocate capital? And we do it. And so first of all is to, uh, uh, to grow the company. Uh, and we do that, and it's not only as as I've described through our R and D and our own uh, technology development internally, where we uh, develop things and and create uh, uh, create uh, new revenue in the future, but we also do strategic acquisitions uh, that support our strategy. So that we do allocate, and we do uh, we we do make sure we have enough. Uh, balance sheet uh, ability to make sure that we can grow organically and through M&A. Um, and then after that, uh, we uh, our biggest use of capital recently has been investing in our rental fleet uh, because more and more customers are, are renting our technology. So uh, that takes capital to, to build that rental fleet, but our returns on rental are fantastic. And so we... Um, and we typically get long-term rentals on the capital equipment. So uh, we do apply capital there. And then with the remaining cash, we do want to return some to shareholders. So we uh, we buy back shares. Last year, we, we had a normal course issuer bid and we completed the entire, I think we bought 1.6, our maximum allotment, 1.65 million shares back. Uh, so in August of uh, 2024, we'll be able to renew that Arnold course issuer bid, bid, uh, bid and buy back shares. And then we, uh, offer, we give our shareholders a dividend as well. So that's how we allocate capital currently. And we do have cash still available on our balance sheet. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, one other question that I know everybody listening in is, you know, insider ownership. Do you want to speak to that a little bit as well? Yeah, about uh, you know the total insider ownership is uh, is a, is about nine percent, uh, and um, uh, myself, I uh, I'm just about own a mil- uh, have a million shares of common shares of McCoy stock myself, so I'm a fairly significant shareholder. All right, so this is kind of a random question, but like I, you know, I've asked this a few times on here to various companies, but you know, when you think about you know, where you want to see the company in three to five years. So I'll make this a two-part question. One, who would you say is that large energy services company that, you know, like, man, McCoy, I, I would love it if McCoy Global could get to that point at some point. And then part two is, you know, in your opinion, what is your vision for the company in three to five years? And what are your inflection points that'll get you there? Well, there's a couple of big questions there. So, no, very existential. I apologize. If you look at the <laughs> large multinationals, um, they are in a different business line. So, if you look at the Slumberjays, Halliburtons, Weatherfords, Baker Hughes, um, they largely built their mass on being service companies. They're actually our customers. Uh, almost all of well, they all we we sell pro- stuff to all of those guys. So, um, so they're, they're largely built their base on service. So the big drilling contractors, those are the ones that are, you know, in the billion plus market caps, they're typically service providers. Uh, We do have a couple of peers that are public that are extremely large. Uh, So, but it's a small circle. So I can only think of two, you know, and and the biggest one is National Oil Well Varco. And they're, we're in an interesting relationship with them. We're, we support, they're both a customer and a competitor and uh, to some extent, but, you know, National Oil Oil Varco is a, you know, multi-billion dollar market cap company. Uh, so um, uh, they, um, uh, we don't have a large peer group of large providers. There's a lot of niche players in various uh, equipment and technology providers in, in this industry. Um so that's kind of that landscape, but 
you know, where do we want to be in three to five years from now? I think we have a tremendous opportunity. The next two years is going to be the, um, the, the final commercialization and uh, uh, adoption of our, of our new integrated uh, casing running package. And I think from there, uh, the, the, the room, if we get 30 or 40 percent of the market to adopt this, these technologies, you know, that'll, you know, that could potentially take us to a hundred million dollar market cap fairly quick. And then, you know, on the acquisition side, uh, there are still technologies that are adjacent to what we do that we could acquire or develop. So yeah, it's McCoy, uh, you know, we are a micro cap, uh, and, uh, our, you know, what's the vision, what's the real vision is to be, uh, is to elevate to a small cap. We, you know, I think that's for our shareholders and for our company. That's that's important. So, Jim, that thank you again for we're there. You, you answered all my questions. I really do appreciate it. You know, um, for anybody listening in or watching, where can they go and find more information about McCoy Global? You can find it on www.mccoyglobal.com. Very good. All right, well, Jim, thank you so much for joining me today. Really do appreciate it. Good luck. Stay safe. And I'll see you in Vegas. We'll see you in Vegas. Thank you. Thank you. This podcast is for informational purposes only and is not provided as financial, legal, or any other advice. The information is not investment advice or an offer to buy or sell any securities or make any investment. The views expressed by guest speakers are their own and any reference to third-party product services or information does not constitute an endorsement thereof by SNN or its affiliates. SNN expressly disclaims all liability for any individual's use of the information presented in this podcast.